Hey people, it's Zack and the loneliness. It's finally starting to set in. I see all these people with their friends and partners, and all I have is this Captain America action figure. Even my stuffed Yoshi has found their special someone. I just want a friend. Just one friend. That'll work, I guess. Pixar is the most well-known name in animation. They're the pioneers of the genre. They've made some of the first computer animated shorts and movies. A lot of people think that before Toy Story, there really was nothing else. This isn't true, however. Toy Story and Pixar's other shorts might have been the most well-known, but they certainly weren't the only ones. Although there weren't that many more, mainly because other studios thought computer animation wouldn't be successful. Obviously, they were proven wrong once Toy Story came out, but Pixar really didn't have much competition in their early years. It wasn't until the 2000s where other studios really started pumping out other animated films to compete with them. However, there was one studio that beat Pixar in the race to computer animation. Veggie Tales, produced by Big Ideas Studios. Obviously, Toy Story was a lot more impressive since that was a full movie and Veggie Tales was just a show, but the fact that Bob and Larry were around before Woody and Buzz is pretty impressive. People didn't even know Toy Story existed in 1993, so to them, these were the first real computer animated characters. It was the first time people had seen characters like these. Uh... When the first VeggieTales episode came out, obviously it looked a little rough, but over time the series grew in terms of animation quality and in terms of popularity. Crazy to think that a tomato and a cucumber could achieve this level of success, but whatever, I'm not that devastated that two vegetables are doing better than I am. And with this level of success, there was bound to be some merchandise and some movies. There always is! There actually wasn't as much merchandise as you would expect. It still existed, obviously, but not to the level that you would think. Like, I personally don't think I've ever seen VeggieTales merch in a store. I'm sure it's happened before, but I certainly don't remember. And then, yeah, there were some movies, too. The first one was... Satan. Yeah, that one flopped at the box office. It was a recreation of the Bible story about Jonah. So Big Idea decided, the Bible can't help us, but pirates can. So six years later, in 2008, they produced this movie in all its glory. That's a strong word. In all its greatness. In all its colorfulness. In all its atoms. This film started production in 2005, although Phil Fisher, one of the creators of VeggieTales, had the script completed in 2002, but Big Idea was struggling at the time, so they had to keep pushing it off, but it finally released in theaters on January 11th, 2008, to critical praise across the board. Uh, what I mean is that they praised it for being so mediocre. It's okay. At least that's what most of the critics thought. Cute and fun, but certainly not very deep. But that's what they think. People love these signs for a reason. Well, let's see, after we take a trip down Box Art Lane. Well, on the front here, we got Universal Pictures and Big Ideas present a VeggieTales movie. Well, good, for a second I thought this was part of the Cars franchise. Clever tale for kids and adults alike? Who talks like that? Daily Herald, are you sure you're not all robots? Just please, just don't tell me that it's full screen. Full screen. On the side, oh hi Larry, full screen again. Set sail for adventure. It's a great. We got a summary of the movie and some special features. Ooh, all new extended ending. Finally, after all these years, we can finally see how this movie was meant to end. Oh, it feels so good to have a best friend. I'm noticing a concerning lack of vegetables. Oh, there they are. Yeah, they don't have hands, so they kind of just levitate everything they hold in their hands. Except for this guy, who's the bad guy of the movie. I think I'm gonna call him the Big Bad Pear. The Big Bad Pear and his crew are fighting this other ship, and I guess this guy here is the prince, and he's the Big Bad Pear's nephew. He is... not a pear. The Big Bad Pear is upset because he was banished, so now he's gonna take the prince hostage. Don't go with him, prince! Do something! Well, he actually does manage to escape for a second, but he immediately gets captured again. The Big Bad Pear sends one of his men down to look for the princess, but luckily she's hiding underneath the floor along with this person. The princess tries to go out and fight, but then she realizes she doesn't want to die, so instead she pulls out this metal ball thingy that's supposed to be a help seeker. Well, hopefully it'll get help, but it plunged itself into the water, so I'm not too confident. Then we cut back to the present day, and we see a show being put on at a restaurant. There's two girls sitting at a table, and then we see their boyfriends, and one of them is Larry. Wow, I never would have guessed! She asks Sedgwick, who's the yellow guy, to go and get barbecue sauce, and the other girl asks Elliot, who's Larry, the same thing. But they both say no, because it's in the back room, and they're scared. Scared of the back room, or scared of barbecue sauce? So they decide to ask their friend George, and he's in a bad mood because his wife is cheating on him with Sir Frederick. And I mean, who can blame her? Look how cool this guy is! I love murder, 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 I love murder! 
idols, murder idols, murder idols, murder idols. So later on in the night, they're cleaning up in the restaurant when this random guy pops out of the table. He tells them something about adventure and crabs and donkeys, and then he leaves. Larry thinks he means they should be in the show, so they decide to audition. Look, just murder a guy and you've got the part. Well, they don't, and they ruin the whole set, and they get fired and kicked out of the restaurant. But that's when the orb shows up in front of them. George and Sedgwick think it's a bomb, but Larry doesn't think it's a bomb, so he pushes the button and a rowboat falls from the sky. Then he pushes it again, and this time they get teleported to the ocean. They row over to a ship they see, and the princess we saw earlier is there. The butler doesn't trust them, but the princess does, so she welcomes them aboard, and they set sail. And man, if Sedgwick talked about TiVo right now, I would eat ketchup-flavored seasoning. So, you guys got TiVo? No, uh, TiVo. It's the recording thing with the TV thing. Sedgwick! So anyway, they start setting sail and they run into a bunch of rocks, but George is fine with it. What's the worst that could happen? Death. Well, luckily, Sedgwick literally kills everyone on the other ship by blasting a cannon at them, and they make it out unscathed. We also get to check in on the prince, and he's in the Big Bad Pears hideout, where people get locked in cages, and please watch your step floor signs don't exist. We cut back to the ship, and they end up finding a random inn in these rocks. The princess says they need to ask one of the pirates who the sword belongs to so they can find her brother, but we know it belongs to the Big Bad Pear. They go inside where there's a bunch of dancing and singing pirates. Eh, that happened to me once, it's fine. George walks over to a table and tries to ask them who the sword belongs to, but he gets nervous and walks away. Luckily, Sedgwick here is a lot better at talking to them, but when he asks them about the sword, they all walk away. Except for one creepy guy behind the bar who tells them that there's a secret cave that has clues on how to find the Big Bad Pear's hideout. And we also find out that he got banished because he tried to take the throne for himself since he wanted to be the king instead of his brother. Hearing all of this, the pirates almost decide to give up, but the princess tells them they can't go home until their work is done, so they decide to keep going. The butler shows them a map where the cave's supposed to be, and they decide to sail over there while also doing nothing. That is what they do best, even though breathing technically is something. I don't know what to believe in anymore. So, we see a montage of them doing nothing, but over time, George starts to take his job more seriously, and he starts doing things? I really don't know what to believe in anymore. They end up coming across a big storm, but George hasn't slept in days, I don't think, so he decides to sail right into it, much to the dismay of Larry and Sedgwick. Luckily, when they start to get closer to it, it disappears, and they find the island they were looking for behind it. They start to row over to it, but we see some big bad pirates watching the princess on the ship. And... Well, it cuts back to the other pirates, so we'll have to check on these guys later. Anyways, the pirates find the cave, and they start looking for clues, and they end up finding a mural on the wall with a riddle telling them where to go. But then Sedgwick finds the greatest thing ever, a cave full of cheese curls. And obviously, he decides to stay in the cave and abandon his friends. I mean... They are cheese curls. But once they leave, Cedric discovers that the cheese curls are actually weird creatures and they start chasing him around the cave. Meanwhile, back on shore, George discovers that their boat is missing since those pirates we saw earlier went to the ship and captured the princess. And the metal ball also starts blinking, meaning they can finally go home. At first, Elliot wants to, but then he decides to stay and help George and they start trying to catch up with the boat. Meanwhile, Sedgwick is about to give up and end it all, but then a crab hands him a picture of him and his girlfriend and he gains motivation and he climbs out of the cave and escapes. Then we finally get to check back in with the Prince, and I don't think he's doing so well. The big bad pair says he's gonna kill him and the princess as well as their father so that he can be king. So I guess big bad pair is upset because the current king took their family's wealth and gave it to the poor. He wants to know when the king will return, but the prince refuses to tell him, so the big bad pair gives him two hours to remember or else VEGETABLE SOUPS FOR LUNCH! We cut back to George and Elliot, and they find the island the fortress is supposed to be on, so they land on the beach and start looking for more clues. Elliot starts playing with some little rocks, and then a pathway opens up in the mountains, but he also ends up waking up some giant rock people that live on the mountain. Oh, kinda funny, I used that as an excuse in elementary school once. There's a whole family of them, and right when it looks like VEGETABLE SOUPS FOR DINNER! Sedgwick swims to the shore, and the cheese curl creatures start chasing him, which causes the rock family to laugh, and they take the cheese curl creatures for entertainment. The pirates have to get going, otherwise they won't make it to the pathway in time, since it's starting to close. Well, considering Sedgwick literally just swam 92 nautical miles, I don't think they have that much to worry about. But instead what happens is the giant rock guy creates a big splash and he sends them catapulting into the fortress. Once they're there, they get attacked by a giant metal dragon. Funny, I also used that as an excuse in elementary school once. Anyways, Elliot gets eaten by the dragon thing, but he finds a lever inside and he shuts it down. They head inside of the fortress and they end up finding the dungeon where the prince and princess are being kept. Oh, and the butler. They notice that the keys are hanging above one of the cells, and there's a guard under them, but luckily Cedric has his little robot contraption, and he's able to retrieve the keys, and he gets them out of the cell. But of course, the butler has to make a mistake and slams the door, which wakes up the guard. Just kill him like Sir Frederick. 
The big bad pair shows up and he tells the pirates he's gonna kill the princess if they don't tell him when the king will come back. Luckily, George remembers that old guy's words, something about donkeys, and he sees a donkey on the chandelier, so he throws the sword at it and it comes crashing down and decapitates the big bad pair. Do you even know what happens when you decapitate the big bad pair? Well, I guess you get chased down the hallways, but luckily the metal ball summons a rowboat for them, so they're able to escape down the stairs. They arrive in a big water storage area, and George makes it drain, and they go flying out of it. But the big bad pair puts his body back on, and now he and his men are chasing them with their ship. They start shooting cannons at them, but then the king breaks through the rocks and destroys the big bad pair's ships, and he ends up drowning, but not without swearing vengeance, as all good villains should. Anyways, the king awards them all medals, he gives the speech about adventure and bravery and what makes a good hero, and they go home. But guess who grabs onto the boat when they're about to leave? The big bad pair guy, and he follows them to the present. Oh, I thought that was Thomas Jefferson. He starts attacking Sir Frederick, now look who's the one getting killed, but the pirates swoop in and try to stop him. They engage in some battle shenanigans, but the ball starts blinking and they send him home. But right at the end of the movie, the ball starts blinking again, so I guess they're going on another adventure, but we'll never get to see it. But that's fine, because this movie was pretty good by itself. The Big Bad Pair was an okay villain, and some of the jokes were actually pretty good, although some were a little outdated. What manner of magic is this? It's no magic. It's Radio Shack! Although honestly, about halfway through the movie, I did start to get a little bored, really not much happens when they get to the sea. It's just them sailing to a bunch of different places, the beginning and end are definitely the most interesting parts. But I'd say this is a very okay movie, and on the Zacker Attacker Movie Raider, I'd give it a 7.2 out of 10. I enjoyed some parts of it, but I don't really have any interest in watching it again for a while. But what matters most, is that I made a new friend along the way. The pirates who don't do anything, you are a true friend, and I know that you will have my back no matter what. Wait, where are you going? Jonah? You were working for him the whole time? Are you insane? You were working for my enemy the whole entire time? I trusted you. I gave you my deepest, darkest secrets, and this is how you repay me? Maybe being alone isn't so bad after all.